So in this video, we're going to be talking more about the angular spectrum. And in particular, we're going to be talking about how to interpret uh, high frequency components, so very high values of kx. And so uh, let's, let's say once again that we've got a slit, and this slit can equivalently be represented by an aperture function, g of x, or g in of x. And we're interested in seeing how that propagates to some output slit or some output uh, screen, sorry, a distance away, some distance d. Now up to this point, we've been representing an, the angular spectrum just as the different angled plane waves that we need to produce some, uh, some value of kx at this, at, at this aperture, this input plane. And so we've got some effective wavelength, lambda x, and at the screen, uh, our the, the sinusoid that we see might look something like this. But if we keep tilting this plane wave, we keep tilting it, tilting it, tilting it as much as we possibly can, uh, then eventually we'll get a plane wave that is completely um, perpendicular to the aperture. Uh, lambda x is just equal to lambda of the plane wave. So say the plane wave is propagating in this direction. Uh, so lambda x is equal to lambda, or kx is equal to k. And this, is, it, this seems like the highest frequency possible plane wave that we can support using this angular spectrum interpretation. But you could very well have features that are uh, much, that are even higher frequency than that. So features that are cl more closely spaced. Uh, like I could go down to the clean room and fabricate some holes that are like 200 nanometers wide and then use a laser that's like 600 nanometers in wavelength and we'd be like, well, what happens? We, we, can't, uh, we can't interpret this any longer as an angled, like a differently angled plane wave. But if you take the transform, so if you take the Fourier transform g in of kx, you will see, so uh, I'm gonna just try and represent the magnitude of g in of kx. Um, you will see some high frequency components. So say that this is, uh, this is our, spacing lambda let's call this uh what, what do you what do you want to call this lambda s so this is going to be the spacing of our slits uh, so let's call this frequency ks and ks in in our case is greater than k so it's greater than the maximum value that we can support and really i should be drawing this as a double-sided because we we've got a real real slit so this is ks is minus ks and it's symmetric so how are we supposed to interpret this Fourier transform? Well, we can go back to our transfer function. So let's go back to our transfer function h, and let's not make the paraxial approximation. So let's keep it as the square root. So one minus kx over k squared. So what happens to this transfer function when we've got frequencies higher than k? So what happens when kx is larger than k? And let's uh, get rid of this one for now. Um, actually, let's leave that one in here. Uh, if kx is larger than k, then this value is going to be greater than 1. Uh, or we're subtracting a value larger than 1 from 1. And so this whole thing inside square root, this argument is going to be negative. And we know that when we take the square root of a negative number, we get an imaginary number, in our case j, because I'm an electrical engineer. Sorry about that. Um, so this value becomes an imaginary number, and so we've got e to the j k d, uh, and I'm gonna call this whole value alpha. Or actually, bad choice, that has other meanings. I'm gonna call this, uh, let's call it beta. Beta doesn't mean anything in the context of optics, not as far as I'm aware. So uh, this negative square root becomes j beta, so beta is just gonna be defined as uh, kx squared over k squared minus one. And it's a, so it's a positive real number. Uh, and so we've got e to the j, oh sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening. Uh, e to the j k d times j beta. And that's just, we multiply j by j, we get e to the minus k d times beta. So when we propagate by a distance d, we're no longer in, we're no longer changing the phase, but we're actually attenuating the plane wave. So I'm gonna say that alpha, our attenuation coefficient, is just equal to k beta. And so our transfer function is e to the minus alpha d. 
And so as we propagate a distance d away from the screen, rather than just uh, rather than our plane wave advancing, rather than our plane wave propagating in space, it instead attenuates. So it attenuates. Uh, and so if we were to write out the entire plane wave, uh, this very high frequency plane wave, we could write it as e to the minus j kx times x, where kx can be very high frequencies. That's that's totally fine. But now instead of propagation in the z direction, we get e to the minus alpha d. So propagate by distance d, attenuate the plane wave. Or sorry, this actually shouldn't be a minus jkx. It should be a positive jkx. And if we want to write this out in its entire form, so uh, let's let's say we want to add back in the time dependence. This becomes e to the j kx times x uh, x minus omega t times e to the minus alpha d. Or even even better, back into its real representation, uh, cosine of kx times x minus omega t times e to the minus alpha d. So this is a, no longer a plane wave propagating in two dimensions. This is a plane wave that's only propagating along the x-axis and is attenuated very rapidly along the, uh, along the z-axis. Because this alpha term is proportional to k, or 2 pi over lambda. So we've got e to the minus 2 pi over lambda times some coefficient which is on the order of 1. Uh, times d. So very quickly, as, as d becomes much greater than lambda, and in general, we're interested in macroscopic values of d, so this might be millimeters, it might be centimeters, it might even be meters, but the wavelength is typically on the orders of nanometers to, to microns. So this plane wave attenuates so, so fast in the z direction as we propagate uh, or as we try and propagate this plane wave. And so it's as if, uh, as we propagate away from, this, uh, away from this aperture to some screen far away, all of the information, all of this super high frequency information is being lost. Or our plane waves cannot, uh, it, they actually cannot carry this information away from the screen. And you could interpret this actually in terms of uh, Nyquist's theorem. So because these slits are higher frequency than the carrier, than the, um, than the wave that they support, they're essentially getting eliminated. So they're getting attenuated. They're not even getting aliased. They're just getting destroyed. And uh, let me just make this clear. These, these plane waves should also have the same wavelength lambda, even though I've, I've drawn that as a, as a little smaller. Um, but this is really interesting because this means that if we have really high frequency patterns or we have rapidly varying patterns in our aperture, these will actually die off. Uh, so these will die off if, our, uh, if this Ks value is greater than the maximum value that we can support is greater than 2 pi over lambda. And these waves, these exponentially decaying waves away from the aperture are called evanescent waves. And uh, one interesting property is that because they're not propagating in the z direction, so not uh, propagating in z, this means they're not carrying power in z. So no energy uh, is going to be delivered. Uh, delivered. What, what, what happened there? Uh, delivered in z. Or if we've got some faraway detector, uh, these waves are not going to contribute any energy to this detector. They're not going to be visible, perhaps. That energy is actually being blocked by the aperture. So it's as if our aperture is really, uh, really an opaque aperture and not transparent at all. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like down below. And also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below as well. And I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.